Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 3 of Frontend Center. Today I want to talk about SVG. I don't think most frontend developers are as comfortable with SVG as they should be. It's one of the most powerful technologies available on the web, yet it can sometimes seem quite complicated to use. Today I want to talk about why I think working with inline SVG lets you solve a lot of UI problems with very little mental overhead. This is the first of two videos I'm dedicating to inline SVG. Today we're looking at the kinds of problems we can solve by hand writing chunks of SVG. We'll start by discussing what I'm calling the three distinct modes of SVG on the web. That is, the three different ways a browser can interpret and execute an SVG file. Because I think that's a huge source of confusion. Each mode has its own limitations, and so you might be looking at some documentation or a blog post or some kind of cool demo, and it won't be clear whether what you're seeing is actually relevant to the way you're working with SVG. Next, I want to show just how easy it is to handwrite some inline SVG to build a small piece of UI. I feel like a lot of people, and I've certainly been guilty of this myself, will go out of their way to build something that's quite awkward with HTML and CSS that would be way simpler to draw with SVG. So I'll demonstrate just how simply you can drop in some SVG into an existing UI and talk about what you can do with it. Finally today, I'll demonstrate a couple of more advanced transitions that SVG is capable of that would be difficult or impossible to achieve with CSS alone. Okay, let's begin. What do I mean when I say that SVG has different modes? Well, in short, there are a lot of different ways to get SVG onto a website, and depending on which one you use, the SVG behaves differently. These break up into three groups, which I'm calling object, image, and inline. And to understand why they're so different, we need to understand what the web was like when SVG was first proposed. The first version of the SVG spec came out in 2001 and included pretty much everything that's there today. At its core, it's a vector image format, of course, but it also included the ability to define complex animations. Maybe most surprisingly though, it also allowed you to respond to user input and manipulate elements programmatically using JavaScript, which takes it well beyond the scope of a normal image format. But this is understandable when you consider what the landscape looked like back then. IE6 was brand new and pretty much any rich interactivity or animation was done using the Flash plugin. So it made sense for SVG to take on all these extra features, effectively creating a file format on par with Flash. A few years later, when browsers started to natively support SVG, that conceptual model persisted. And so when you reference an SVG file using an embed object or iframe tag, you're effectively loading a foreign object that the browser has no knowledge about, like a flash file. The file stands alone. You embed it on a page, it defines its own interactions and animations, but crucially, you have little or no control over it from outside. In the modern web, it creates a barrier between authoring the SVG and using the SVG, which I think in a lot of cases ought not be there. The next mode is simply using an SVG as an image, either from an image tag or a background image in CSS. This is conceptually really simple, and I'd say it's probably the usage that most people are familiar with. Comparing it to object mode, you can see that it's simpler because some of the more advanced parts of SVG have been disabled. It can no longer run its own JavaScript, which means it can't respond to user interactions. And while it can still run animations, it's now become a purely visual object. It's much more like a PNG or animated GIF than it is a flash file. But notice that it's still not controllable from outside. It's still a self-contained object, and if we want to change anything about it, we have to go back to the original file and make an edit. So while using SVG as images is certainly simple, it's not very flexible. If we want flexibility, we need to use SVG in the third mode, inline. By writing SVG markup directly in a HTML document, we find that all this separation of SVG and the rest of your app disappears, reducing the cognitive overhead of switching between them dramatically. You can think of it simply like dropping into drawing mode within a document, like an extension to the HTML language. To me, this makes a lot more sense than an SVG file that's self-contained, because these days, there'll be interactions and animations applying to CSS and HTML elements as well. Inline SVG elements, like any HTML element on the page, becomes controllable from outside. That is, with the same JavaScript and CSS that you're already writing. And so, when you think about animating or handling user interactions or changing styles based on context, you don't need to look up the SVG way of doing those things. You use the same tools you're already comfortable with. And to me, that's the big win. So now I want to look at some of the properties of working with inline SVG by showing what it's like to solve a simple UI problem by writing some by hand. Consider a simple form. We have two inputs, a username and password, and a sign-in button. It's pretty bland, but it's okay. The problem is we have a very subtle focus indicator when we click on one of these fields. You get a blinking cursor and the border at the bottom darkens slightly. It's so subtle I'm not even sure it's going to show up in the video. That's a problem for accessibility, particularly for people navigating using a keyboard or with less than perfect eyesight. And we've caused it by making the same mistakes a lot of websites do, 
which is disabling the default focus outline on these elements, which is okay as long as we provide a sufficient alternative. I'm gonna do that by introducing a small piece of SVG. The first thing we have to do is define a view box. Now there's a lot to understand about the view box, but we really don't need to know any of that now. We can think of it simply as defining the dimensions of our drawing. So a view box of 0, 0, 20, 20 defines a space that has an aspect ratio of one to one or a square, but also sets the relative size of pixels within the SVG. Generally, I pick a multiple of 10 that's close to the size it'll end up being rendered at. That's just for convenience. The good news is when we've set it, we'll know that the final SVG will scale to whatever size we need. The next part is to tell the browser how big to render the SVG. We can do this with CSS, but for now, let's just give it a width of one rem. We don't need to give it a height. Browsers will look at the aspect ratio defined in the view box and the width that we set and figure out the height that's needed. Here we can see it's rendered at 16 by 16 pixels. Now let's draw a simple path. From 0, 0, draw a line to 10, 10, then continue to 0, 20. We've made a triangle, but I don't want a triangle, I wanted a path, so I have to set the fill to none and the stroke to a color. This is probably a good point to discuss how these properties interact with CSS, because this is one of the strengths of working with inline SVG. I'm just gonna add a class to the SVG element, which also means I can move the width definition across to CSS. Now, you might expect that declaring styles using attributes in SVG like fill none and stroke black would be the equivalent of using inline styles in CSS, and therefore it would be quite difficult to override them from outside. But it turns out these presentational attributes actually have the lowest specificity available, so they're trivial to override. We can set virtually all presentational attributes like this in CSS. Note again that it's only because we're using inline SVG that we can write selectors that reach inside the SVG structure like this. So let's simplify the SVG code by moving these attributes across to CSS as well. Now we just need to show or hide this arrow based on whether the input is focused. We can use a trick here. By placing the SVG after the icon, we can use the focus pseudo selector and the adjacent sibling selector to show the icon. And then because we're using Flexbox for this UI, we can use the order property to make the SVG appear on the left. This is just one of the many reasons why I love Flexbox. There are other ways to reverse things in CSS, but you really can't beat the simplicity of the order property. Let's just add a little transition and slide this in from the left so it doesn't just appear. Great, now to get it onto the password field as well, we just have to copy the markup. If we're using any kind of template language or component framework, obviously we could abstract this duplication, but for now this is okay. Now we have an obvious visual cue about what field is currently in focus. If you want to look at the code as it is now, I've posted it online here. We definitely could have built something this simple in CSS, but by using SVG, we've used techniques that apply to much more complex situations. And so I think it's worth flexing your SVG muscles by writing some by hand from time to time. To finish today, I want to look at the sorts of effects that are either impossible with CSS alone or just extremely difficult, and how easy they are with SVG. I'm going to be focusing on the stroke dash array and stroke dash offset properties because they're extremely reliable and present us with plenty of useful effects. It would be even better to animate the transform property since we can manipulate the arrangement of individual elements, but doing that with CSS is not supported in all the browsers you're likely to support. As we've already seen, you can transform the SVG tag itself, which gives you some effects, but for a cross-browser way of transforming inner elements like paths, we'll need to use JavaScript. That'll be the topic of a future episode, but for now, we'll stick to CSS-only techniques using dash array and offset. Here's our example from before, except we're now validating the presence and length of each of these fields. The username now needs at least four characters to be valid and the password eight. And you can see that the border below the input changes to green once it's valid and red if it's left in an invalid state. That's just being done with CSS and the valid and invalid pseudo selectors. The only complication here is that I'm not showing the red border until this data touched attribute has been set. I've got a little bit of JavaScript running here that sets this data attribute whenever you submit the form and it's invalid or blur the input. It just means that if I refresh the page, these fields start out gray, but if we try to submit, they all go red. I like to use the built-in HTML form validation stuff wherever possible, but it does need a little bit of UX tweaking from time to time. Anyway, back to the SVG. If I wanted to animate this arrow in a slightly different way, I could delete the opacity and transform effects and add a dash array property. Let's make it a bit bigger so we can see what's happening. 
If we only set one value for the dash array, it sets dashes of a certain size and gaps of the same size. As you can see though, every time we change the dash array, we can transition between them smoothly, making line effects. If we set a second value, that determines how big the gaps will be, and again, they're smoothly interpolated. The next property is stroke dash offset, which changes the start point for these calculations. Positive values shift the line backwards, negative values shift the line forwards. If we wanted to have this arrow start in the center and grow outwards on focus, we can set the dash array to 1, followed by a reasonably large number, to give us a point, and then start changing the offset to try and find the midpoint. It's somewhere between 13 and 14, it seems, but we can actually get an exact figure using the JavaScript API. If we select the element in Inspector, it's available in console as $0, and then we can call get total length and get the exact length of the line. Divide that by 2 and subtract 0 0.5 because our dash is one pixel long and we have the dash offset we need. Paste that in and we've got our dash right on the front of the arrow. Now, when we focus the field, we want to change both these values until the effect is smooth. Let's start by setting the offset to zero, and we'll see that we have the dot sliding up the top of the arrow. We just need to grow the dash at the same rate until it's the size of the entire arrow. Moving that down to one rem, we see the effect. Now we can set that initial dash size to zero to completely hide it and add 0 0.5 to the initial offset, and we have a simple arrow draw itself in. Now I just want to implement one more effect, because I think it can be a bit of a trap to see SVG only used for icons, and things that look like icons. I want to demonstrate an animated version of the border at the bottom of this input. I'm going to create a new chunk of SVG below the icon called line, which I'm going to make only 2 pixels high but 40 pixels wide, with a simple path straight down the middle from left to right. If we set a width and a stroke on that element, you can see it drawing, but it's far too thick. We only want something 1 or 2 pixels high. But if we set the height to 2 pixels, we see that the line only draws in the very center here. That's because by default an SVG with a view box will preserve the aspect ratio of the drawing, as well as keep the view box visible. We can override this by setting preserve aspect ratio to none, and the 40 by 2 pixel line is stretched out over the full size of the SVG. If we set a left margin on this line, we can make it the same size as the input's border. Now the effect that I'm looking for is like the arrow, I want the darker border to draw in from the middle outwards when we focus the field. We can do this by making two lines, one on top of the other. SVG makes placing elements on top of each other really easy, and since there's no z-index, everything is just drawn from top to bottom, I think it's a lot easier to reason about. I've given the second line a class, so we can target it separately. Let's move that grey colour from the border to the stroke of the SVG. Then let's set the focus line to black, and only show it when the input is focused. I'm using tilde instead of plus here because it's not the adjacent sibling. That's pretty much what we had before, but now we can animate more than just the opacity. Since we know our line is 40 pixels long, our calculations for the dash array and offset to draw this in from the middle are much simpler. We can make a zero length dash with 20 pixels spacing each side, right in the middle of the line using an offset of negative 20 pixels. Then we make the dash 40 pixels wide and the offset zero when the input is focused. The end result is quite nice, an animated border drawing in. To finish the demo, let's restore the valid and invalid styles and make them draw in in the same way. I'm also going to copy the markup for the password field now as well, because it won't change again. We can give these new lines the same default state as the focus line, using dash array and dash offset to make them invisible. They do, however, need different stroke colors, but we can copy that from the earlier code that changed the border color. Now we can reuse these selectors here to trigger the transition. A valid input will show the valid line, and an invalid input will show the invalid one. And now we see the line first draw black when we focus, then draw green when we're successful. 
If we tab away on the password field, the invalid line draws in, drawing our attention back to that field. But when we've typed enough characters that this field is now valid, the green line draws in over the top. And that's it. We've used a series of lines, all with their own colors and being shown under different conditions, to achieve a pretty nice effect. We've used SVG where we don't preserve the aspect ratio to replace something, a border, that we'd normally do with CSS. I think there's a lot of opportunities to use SVG in this way, to add a little bit of animation or character to your interfaces without requiring particularly much work or a completely different skill set. As always with Front End Center, the source code is available if you'd like to dig in and better understand anything we covered today. Thanks for watching. If you're new to the channel, Front End Center is a subscription screencast series where we release two episodes like this every month covering all sorts of topics related to front end web development. There are four more episodes currently available to subscribers, including the sequel to this episode, where we look at automating some of these steps so you can work with design software like Sketch, but still make use of the full power of inline SVG and CSS. I'll also be releasing episodes here on YouTube every few months, but if you want to stay up to date or just want to support the channel, please head over to frontend.center and subscribe.